So the theme for today, time to bring animal testing to an end. Um, and Kirsty, if you could just um, switch on to the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. So just a little bit about who we are at Cruelty Free International. So Cruelty Free International, we work to end animal experiments worldwide. Uh, and we do this by investigating and exposing the reality of life for animals in laboratories. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a second. We challenge decision makers to make a positive difference for animals, which is where my role as Director of Public Affairs sits. Um, we also champion better science and cruelty-free living, cruelty-free living through our Leaping Bunny programme. And our vision as an organisation is a world where no one wants or believes we need to experiment on animals. Um, next slide. So I've put this slide up. Um, it's a quote from the Oxford Centre for Animal Ethics and it dates back to 2015. And they said that they described animal experiments as the deliberate and routine abuse of innocent sentient animals involving harm, pain, suffering, stressful confinement, manipulation, trade and death and they say that that should be unthinkable. Uh, and unfortunately, as the statistics that I go on to talk about throughout this presentation show, it's not unthinkable. Um, and it's something that isn't reducing uh, in this day and age, and we think it desperately should be. Um, can we change slide, please, Kirsty? Um, so before I detail why we at Cruelty Free uh, International are opposed to animal experiments, I thought one thing that we could perhaps do is just to involve all of you in, in the presentation, um, and it would be really great feedback for me to know. If you want to stick in the chat, um, perhaps some of your ideas about why, if you are opposed to animal experiments, why you're opposed to animal experiments, and we can perhaps share um, some of that chat. But for Cruelty Free International, there are a number of reasons um, why we oppose animal experiments. And the first is because we believe animal research to be morally and ethically wrong. Um, it's our view that involving inflicting deliberate suffering on another sentient being, which isn't for their benefit and to which they cannot give consent, uh, is wrong. Um, next bullet, please, Kirsty. Um, and in addition to our ethical and moral challenge to animal experimentation, we also believe that there are very serious questions over the scientific value of animal experiments. Uh, and increasingly scientists are asking those questions themselves. Uh, and I think one figure that you will often see cited, which comes from the National Institutes of Health in the US, is that at least 90% of drugs fail in human trials despite promising results in animals. So not only are there moral and ethical questions, but there are big questions about why we're inflicting this harm on animals for very little or no benefit uh, for human health. Uh, we also oppose animal experiments because humane non-animal methods are increasingly being developed. And where they have been developed, we know that they are often cheaper, quicker, and more reliable than the animal tests that they replace. Next slide. So with all of that evidence, you would be justified in asking why are animal experiments still happening? Um, one of the reasons is because science, industry, governments and regulators are resistant to change. I guess in some ways, like all of us, it's more comfortable to do what you've always done and animal experiments is, is what they've always done. And changing that status quo can be incredibly challenging and incredibly difficult. Another reason is because so much more funding and political support is given to animal research than it is to humane and human relevant science. Um, and a few years back, we did some research um, that found that less than 0.04% of the UK science budget was devoted to developing new approach methodologies, which is the term that we use for animal free research. Oh, we seem to have hopped a, a bullet. 
Um, and another reason is because scientists obviously need to have their research published in peer reviewed journals before they can progress. Uh, and uh, scientists who use humane non animal research tell us that it can be very difficult to get published without animal tests. So those are, are, are the three, you know, big reasons that we found for why animal experiments are still used. So when I, when I um, introduce what Cruelty Free International does, one of the key things that, that we do is to investigate and expose the reality of life for animals who continue to suffer in laboratories. And this picture um, that you have here of the dog with the, the number on his, on his head, um, that was a picture that we released on the 8th of April. Um, of a very new investigation that was brought to us by a whistleblower working in a contract animal testing facility in Madrid in Spain, Viva Technia. Um, you may have seen the news, you may have seen this in the press, on our social media channels, on our, web, web, on our website. It's been a huge story um, over the past two weeks. Um, and maybe click to the next slide. Uh, we initially released the results of um, this investigation via the Guardian. Um, and what we found was some shocking levels of gratuitous cruelty and abuse against the animals kept there, pigs, dogs, rabbits, rats, mice, and monkeys used predominantly in um, toxicology testing. Um, for companies globally in the EU, in the UK, in Latin America, in the US, um, and, and in Asia. Uh, and as a result of the revelations from the Viva Technia facility, the Madrid authorities have suspended um, this laboratory's license to operate. Um, and we are now part of a complaint to uh, a judge in Madrid. Uh, seeking to remove that license permanently. And I think the work that we do in investigations is incredibly important. There is a huge lack of transparency um, around animal testing, what happens behind the closed doors of animal testing facilities. And exposing that to the public is, is you know, one of our, our core activities and something that's incredibly important. And we hope can lead to, to change. Um, one of the things that I think we argue very strongly is that though our investigations reveal very cruel members of staff, for example, in this facility uh, in Madrid, uh, and reveal um, laboratory facilities where there is systemic abuse, uh, we would very strongly make the case that it's not necessarily about these individuals these individual members of staff or these individual facilities, it's about a system that is cruel and a system that is wrong and a system that allows these to happen. Be that in Madrid or in Spain, where the authorities have a legal obligation to inspect under EU law animal testing facilities, we would ask the question, what was happening with the investigations, uh, with the inspections of Viva Technia? Um, but also on a larger scale, every time uh, we run an undercover investigation, we published one 18 months ago at a facility LPT in Germany, mm -hmm. we see the same levels of cruelty. Um, and every time we are left asking the same questions of the national authorities and the European authorities. Uh, so we, you know, we believe that this is a, a systemic issue and something that fundamentally has to change. Many of the tests, most of the tests that we revealed uh, at Viva Technia are, as I say, tests that are required by European law, it's regulatory toxicity testing. Um, and, and, you know, the breaches, of, the breaches of law in terms of the way that these animals were housed and handled were very clear, as were the cases of um, gratuitous abuse and, and cruelty. Um, next slide. There is a full video of what we found at Viva Technia on our YouTube channel. Um, but here is just a handful of the pictures that we found. Um, in your top right, you'll see a rabbit being subjected to a Dre's test. 
Um, and this is a really important finding at this investigation because there is a validated and accepted non-animal alternative to that test that should be being used in Europe. So to find that test being used in a European facility was really shocking. Um, uh, and the other pictures are of uh, a, a primate test. What followed there was a member of staff drawing um, a face on the genitals of, of that particular monkey. Um, and these, you know, I know these photos can be very disturbing, they're very graphic, but, you know, if you do want to see more, there are on our website and the full video is on our YouTube channel. Um, Kirsty, if you want to flip to the next slide. So we have a petition running on change.org to close the Viva Technia laboratory. We're, um, I think, about 640,000 signatures now in under two weeks. Um, as I say, the Madrid authorities have suspended the license to operate and there are legal cases um, now being taken as a result. The animal protection director of the central Spanish government um, has also announced that they will be investigating and that they will be taking action. So the more people who sign that petition, um, the more impact that we, we will have. We also want to feed this back up to the European Commission um, who have responsibility for the European wide legislation that governs the use of animals in experiments to say, why is it that time after time when we uncover these things, there is no change. Um, so please do sign the petition if you haven't already so that we can talk to the Spanish authorities, to the local authorities in Madrid, but also keep pushing um, these issues up to the European Commission and, and European decision makers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as well as exposing and investigating the reality of life for animals in laboratories, we use what we find to challenge decision makers um, in the UK, in Europe, in North America uh, and around the globe. Uh, and as part of that, we very recently ran um, some polling in March 2021, online polling in Scotland. Um, and I think Kirsty, yeah, there you go. Kirsty's going to run uh, a live poll for all of you on this call um, with some of the questions that we ran in that YouGov polling in Scotland. So the first one that we'd like you to, to answer is, do you think that the UK should set deadlines to phase out animal testing? Yes or no? And the second one, do you think it's unacceptable to test on cats, dogs, monkeys, and all of the above? Um, I think that poll's open for 30 seconds, if I'm correct. I see the votes coming in now. Awesome, 100% think that the UK should set deadlines to phase out animal testing. Fantastic. Um, and oh, 100% think it's unacceptable to test on all of the above. Great audience, that's brilliant. So how do you sit alongside um, the Scottish public that we polled in March? So 62% of adults in Scotland thought that the UK should set deadlines to phase out animal testing. Um, as you will know, governing animal testing is not um, a, a delegated to the, the Scottish government, to the Scottish Parliament. It sits um, still in Westminster, but we believe that it's really important that people in Scotland, and we're doing a very similar activity in Wales also, uh, and decision makers in, in Scotland, be they in the Scottish Parliament or be they in Westminster, put pressure onto the UK government to set deadlines to phase out animal testing. We do it with other areas of policy that are really important to us, like climate change, for example, um, like representation of women on boards, um, like polluting emissions from vehicles. So why shouldn't we do it with, with animal testing? Why shouldn't we set deadlines to, to phase this out? And we think that setting deadlines will motivate and drive change. And obviously those deadlines need to be realistic and need to be negotiated. But in order to motivate a change, we think they need to, to be set. So it was 62%. And that's fairly uh, representative of polling that, that we do elsewhere. Um, a really strong majority of 79% of the Scottish public found it unacceptable to conduct experiments on animals where non-animal alternatives are already available. And that just seems like an absolute no-brainer. 
but it's really surprising, I think, to find out that that is still happening. Um, and again, on the Cruelty Free International website and on our sister organization website, Cruelty Free Europe, we've detailed some of the tests that are still happening on animals where there are already validated non-animal alternatives available. Uh, and that really shouldn't be the case. And I think we have to make that, uh, that argument really strongly that regulators have got to enforce the use of non-animal alternatives where they are available. And it was great to see that 79% of the Scottish public um, agree with us um, on that. Um, we also asked about alternatives to animal experiments and their prioritization in science and innovation funding. As I mentioned, one of the barriers to ending animal testing is the massive imbalance between the amount of money that goes to animal research and the amount that goes to developing and implementing um, non-animal alternatives. And 76% um, of those that we polled agreed with us that animal alternatives, that alternative animal should be prioritised in science and innovation funding. And that is something that the Scottish Government and the Scottish um, Parliament can do, is to create an investment ecosystem and investment uh, infrastructure in Scotland to encourage companies, to encourage universities to prioritise funding for non-animal experiments and for developing alternatives. Next slide. So in the next slide, um, we replicate the question that we just asked you, where 100% of you said that it was unacceptable. Um, when we polled, we asked people about their views on the use of specific species. 66% uh, thought that it was unacceptable to test on cats. 68% found it unacceptable to test on dogs. And 65% found it unaccept unacceptable to test on the monkeys. Um, and I think this is a really important point because it shows the disconnect when it comes to animal experiments between what the public think uh, and polling, as I say, is really consistent on this. Every few years, the government commissions its own survey from Ipsos Mori on um, the attitudes of the UK public to animal testing and levels of concern are consistently high. And despite this, the UK remains one of the top users of primates and dogs and one of the top animal testers in Europe with 2,850 um, uses of primates and 4,227 uses of dogs and exper experiments in 2019 alone. And one of the challenges we face as an organisation is conveying that very clear public opinion to our decision makers and encouraging them to, to act on that. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is um, a slide that shows something that's called an early day motion. I won't bore you with the details of Westminster parliamentary procedure, but I've picked this one out as a really good example of what's happening in Scotland and where I think Scotland is leading the way um, when it comes to challenging animal experiments. So we tabled um, through six uh, members of parliament this EDM asking for a better finance and regulatory infrastructure in the UK for developing new approach methodologies and non-animal research. Um, it got an amazing 102 signatures for MPs, but what is really significant is that I think over three quarters of the SNP parliamentary party at Westminster signed this lots more than any any other party um, at Westminster. So I think we have a real opportunity working with Scotland's decision makers to create that pressure for change in the UK. Um, and Kirsty mentioned at the top of this presentation, the work that one kind are doing around the May the 6th elections in Scotland and the inclusion of um, an ask for decision makers to uh, put pressure on the UK government to phase out animal experiments. So I think you guys in Scotland are a really powerful weapon for us um, to, to pursue this um, to pursue this goal. And on the next slide, I've just set out an initiative that we're running as Cruelty Free International, and you can find this on our website, www.cruelty-free-international.org or on our social media. And we are asking all of you, uh, all of our supporters, all of Scotland's electorates to reach out to your candidates in the May the 6th election to urge them to use their voice to speak out for animals in laboratories. It's a really easy tool. You can input your postcode, 
Um, it pulls up all your candidates um, and will fire off an email to them for you, um, asking them as your candidates to use their voice to, to speak out against animal testing. Um, I think my latest figure is that 913 people in Scotland so far have used that tool. We've only just launched it. So please, um, if you haven't contacted your candidates, do so and you know share the tool and encourage all your friends and family to do that as well. As I say, it's, also, it's by bridging that disconnect between how we feel and how decision makers act that will make a difference. Um, next slide. So I've looked at investigating. Um, I've looked at our work with decision makers and the third strand of our work at Cruelty Free International is championing better science. Um, I stole the next group of slides from my amazing science colleagues. Um, I'm not a scientist myself. Um, so they've pulled these ones together and it was really interesting before I came onto this call, I was on a call for an all party parliamentary group that we have in Westminster on human relevant science and I was talking to um, a very eminent scientist Professor Michael Balls who's worked in this field for for decades um, and he was telling us about how when he started looking at these issues back in the 19, 1980s um, when we started to change the legislation governing animal experiments in the UK through ASPA the Animals and in, in Scientific Procedures Act there was a lot of excitement that change was on its way and that we were gonna ask some fundamental questions, we we're gonna move away from animal experiments to human relevant science. And he unfortunately said, you know, just how depressed he is that from that period of initial excitement, um, very little has changed. And I think the figures that my science colleagues have, have worked on just illustrate that. So one of the problems we're trying to gather numbers about the number of animals used in animal experiments across the world is that there is an incredible amount of, of opaqueness. Um, it's really not transparent. So you'll see on this slide that when they were gathering the numbers, they found that 79% of countries don't publish the number of animals used in experiments. We do in the UK um, and we do in the EU. Um, but what their work with all kinds of you know, models and extrapolations found is that at least 192 million tests on animals took place across the world in, in 2015. Um, and that's an, astonishing, that's an astonishing number. And that could mean more than 192 million animals because some animals are subject to, to more than one test in a study. Um, of those 192 million, 207,724 were on dogs uh, and almost 160,000 were on monkeys. Um, and as well as the experiments that take place, the number includes animals killed for tissues, used to maintain GM breeding colonies, bred and killed as surplus. So they're bred for experiments and then um, surplus to requirements so are killed and held but not yet used in experiments. Um, next slide, please. Um, so using those, using those figures, and you can see where we've estimated, where we've adjusted, and where we have actual figures, my science colleagues have detailed the top 10 um, countries using animal experiments. Um, and you'll see, that, you know, by far and away, the biggest number there is, is China, which is an estimated figure. Um, and the UK is there in three, four, five, position number seven, um, with a higher number of animal use than any other country uh, in, in Europe at 2,586,942. Um, so there is a lot of work for us to do in the UK. Next slide, please, Kirsty. Um, and these are the EU figures. So these are actual figures because countries in the European Union have to declare um, the numbers of animals used in scientific procedures. Um, and these figures date from when the UK was still uh, a member of the EU. And I think one of the things that really kind of shocks me every time I, I see this slide is just how slow, how gradual, and how very, very disappointing um, the drop in the number of experiments is um, on animals over the years. So, you know, there's, there's a 20-year 
a 20 year pattern here. Um, and what we see is a 20% drop over the last 20 years, which, which equals 1% per year. Uh, and my science colleagues have, have kind of worked out from that how long it will take us at that rate of decline to end animal experiments. Um, and it's a, it's a really long time. Um, and we need to do something uh, now. We need to act now. And we need to support people like you to, to really speed up um, that decline and to really start to make some significant change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I said, um, the United Kingdom is far and away now the largest um, animal experimentation country uh, in the EU, having taken that position over in recent years from, from Germany um, and, and France is there in third place. Interestingly, Spain, uh, where we obviously had the Vivotechnia um, investigation that I talked about earlier is, is the fourth biggest user, which again makes that um, investigation really significant in terms of shifting the dial for animals in laboratories. Um, if we could have the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types um, of testing. So most animal tests of that number that I, I most that I talked about, most animal tests aren't actually animal tests that are required by law. Um, regulatory tests, on the other hand, which make up about 20% of the total, are tests that we require by law. Um, so they're tests that, for example, in Europe would be required by the European Chemicals Agency for chemicals legislation or the European Medicines Agency for uh, medical legislation in the US by the FDA or the EPA, and now post-Brexit um, by the MHRA and the Health and Safety Executive in the UK. So one of the things that Brexit has done, obviously, um, is mean that in the UK, we no longer sit underneath REACH, which is the EU chemical safety um, set of legislation, but we now have our own chemical safety legislation in the UK, and it will be the health and safety executive that will be the regulators in that regard. Um, one of the things that we've been campaigning for um, very actively over the last couple of years is that transferring um, regulatory testing legislation from EU to the UK doesn't mean that we are going to have to duplicate tests here that have already been carried out for chemical safety in the European Union. Um, so regulatory testing is standardized testing that's designed to see whether medicines, chemicals, ingredients in cosmetics or other products are safe for use and, and that they work. Um, it's those tests that we saw um, in Vivotechnia where the animals were forced to eat or inhale the substances, have them rubbed into their shaved bare skin or injected into their bodies. Um, and regulatory testing is one where, um, you know, we, we campaign for change, changes to law um, so that, that those numbers are significantly reduced. Um, we feel that they are not only cruel, but they are unreliable and there are better ways of um, guaranteeing safety um, of chemicals and, and other products for human use. Sorry, Kirsty, next slide. Um, this slide sets out some of the scientific criticisms um, for the use of animals in experiments. Um, so animal experiments are cruel, they are unreliable, and they can even be dangerous. Um, animals don't get many of the diseases, diseases that people do. Um, so signs of those diseases are artificially induced to mimic the human condition. Uh, and I think it's unsurprising, therefore, to find that treatments showing promise in animals rarely work in humans. So, for example, we still have no cure for cancer, AIDS, strokes, diabetes, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Uh, and by continuing to rely on animal experiments, we feel that we are letting people down. Um, and we are not finding answers to some of those big challenges that we face in terms of human health in the 21st century, and that much more needs to be done in terms of human relevant research. Um, and support for animal testing is based still largely on anecdote and is not backed up by the scientific evidence. 
So we aren't asking some of those really fundamental questions. Um, we are continuing to rely on things that we've always done um, rather, than, rather than challenging them. There are a growing number of scientists who are asking those questions and who are challenging them, but you know, much more needs to be done to, to change that. Uh, next slide, please. So the reason we think animal testing is unre unreliable, I mentioned this earlier, is that at least 90% of drugs fail in human clinical trials, even though they've passed preclinical tests, including animal tests. Um, out of 93 dangerous drug side effects, only 19% could have been predicted by animal tests. Cancer drugs have the lowest success rate at 5%, followed by psychiatry, heart and neurology drugs. So some of those big health challenges that we do face in the 21st century uh, are not being addressed by our continued emphasis and reliance on animal experiments. Uh, out of 48 cancer drugs approved by the European Medical Agency from 2009 to 2013 to treat 68 types of cancer, almost half showed no survival benefits. So again, I think we would emphasize that we have to go back to asking those fundamental questions, not only about the ethics and morality of animal testing, but you know, these, these tests just aren't working. They aren't delivering what we need them to deliver for human health and for, for environmental safety. Um, and things really, really need to change. Next slide, please. Um, and not only is animal testing unreliable and cruel, it's, it's also wasteful. So of all of that spending, which as I said, outweighs the spending on non-animal research, um, we are, you know, we're wasting an incredible amount of, of resources. So only 6% of 4,300 international companies involved in drug development have registered a new drug with the FDA in the US since, since 1915. You can only imagine the amount of investment that has gone into such little um, return. The top 10 high grossing drugs in the USA only help between one in four and one in 25 people who take them. So all of the money that's going into all of this infrastructure could really be channeled elsewhere um, for much better return for, for humans and for much less suffering um, on animals. Next slide. Um, so, you know, why are non-animal methods being used more? Um, a lot of, well, the, the hurdles and the barriers are set for not, that are set for non-animal methods for their validation, for their adoption, for their use are a lot higher than the barriers that were ever set for animal tests that really do not have to be validated. One of the challenges is that when we're validating non-animal methods, we're validating them against already unreliable animal tests and we're expecting them to produce equivalent results which you know is is obviously nonsense um, there is a lack of international harmonization which is one of the things that our science team works to try to to, to get um, so that everybody's on a level playing field things aren't having to be repeated um, if a non-animal alternative is validated in one jurisdiction then it can be applied to another um, we've also exposed huge bureaucratic delays between validation and regulatory acceptance. So, for example, in the European Union, the delay between the OECD validating a non-animal method and that then being accepted into the EU canon and enforced across the European Union can be massive. Um, and we recently took a case to the Ombudsman in Europe to try to speak to speed that up because you know it's wrong that bureaucratic delays mean more animal suffering. Um, I think there's a fear also that alternative methods won't be accepted by regulators, uh, which disencourages um, and disincentivizes work on those non-animal methods. Uh, there's an entrenchment in the scientific establishment that new ideas threaten the status quo. There is very low funding, as I outlined earlier, of the development of non-animal methods, which limits the speeds of change. And there is a lack of enforcement, for example, in the EU, where in theory, in theory, in law, it's illegal to do an animal test if an accepted alternative exists, but those tests are still being conducted. Um, and on our sister website and our Cruelty for Europe website, we've got information about 10 animal tests on our rat list. Uh, 10 animal tests in the EU where there are accepted validated alternatives, but those tests are still being conducted in, in, in the EU. Uh, next slide. 
Um, and then finally, in terms of what we do as Cruelty Free International, uh, we champion cruelty free living. So I'm sure um, that you're all aware shoppers and aware consumers, um, and that when you go to look for your cosmetic, personal care and household products, you will look for the Leaping Bunny logo on those products. So it's Cruelty Free International that runs that Leaping Bunny program. Um, and we work with hundreds of brands um, around the globe uh, to develop the our, our globally recognizable gold standard, the Leaping Bunny program for cosmetics, personal care uh, and household products. Um, there are a number of big supermarkets throughout the UK um, and a bunch of, of kind of large and also much smaller brands have been Leaping Bunny approved over the years. Um, you may have seen over the last couple of years um, Leaping Bunny approval of brands like um, Covergirl uh, and very recently in the last couple of months um, Garnier became our most recent um, large addition to the Global Leaping Bunny program. Um, and again, on the Cruelty Free International website, um, if you don't already, you can search for Leaping Bunny approved brands. So that's a really, really quick tour through the different strands of work um, that we do um, at Cruelty Free International. Um, and obviously, I can see that there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A and some comments in the chat. So if I just have a look at the chat, best cruelty free products for hand cream, um, Francesca has asked. Thank you, Francesca. So I just um, refer you to the Leaping Bunny pages um, on the Cruelty Free International website, where all the Leaping Bunny approved products, including um, hand cream products, will, will be listed. Um, and from Tanya, I'm vegan. I hate any animal exploitation. Brilliant. Um, I'll sign the petition and share it. Where can I obtain it from, please? So I assume that refers to the Vivo Technia petition, which is on change.org. Um, so I think if you, you Google change.org and Vivo Technia, it, sh you know, it, should, it should come up. Um, otherwise, I can try um, and post a link into the chat um, here. Um, and a comment from Maureen makes me so angry and sad. Yeah, um, the fact that we're still experimenting on animals in this day and age makes us... Uh, incredibly angry and, and sad too, um, but brilliant that all of you are attending um, who believe the same and who, are want to, who want to change that. 